All right, everybody, uh, welcome to our sort of 20th lecture, which is a special guest lecture. I'm real happy to have uh, Laurent Benayoun and Tom Q, who are co-founders of Hedgetech and, uh, and they're a crypto market maker. And essentially they founded this company um, a couple of years ago and are uh, sort of expert market makers and uh, and are essentially selling technology to for others to make markets and since uh, since we've been looking at market making in the last week uh, I figured this would be a perfect timing for uh, for these guys to present what they're doing and um, and um, th so the lecture 20 uh, which is what they're going to present here is something that will allow you to uh, stream live data and potentially uh, become market makers. So, uh, <laughs> Laurent and uh, Tom, thank you for coming, and um, and feel uh, go for it. It's all you. Thank you, thank you, Professor, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Laurent. This is Tom. We're the two co-founders of Hedgetech. As uh, Professor Sasha mentioned, we are uh, focusing on market making for digital assets, and we thought it would be a good idea to. Um, introduce you to the tools of algo trading applied to market making, more specifically on uh, digital assets. Um, so I'll start, I will briefly introduce myself. I started trading a few years ago, started with Forex and stocks and then moved to crypto. Um, and my background is in pure and applied math. Um, and uh, yeah, and my really like focus in, in the company is strategy design. Oh. Hi. Uh... Uh, my name is Tom. Uh, my background is uh, mathematics and statistics. I have been an uh, algo trader for a couple of years. I started from the futures market and now I'm focusing on digital asset markets. Right. So I think you guys have the lecture notes uh, from what I understood. If you have questions at any point in the lecture, feel free to interrupt. Uh, hopefully we can answer them right away. If not, we'll try to answer them at the end. Um, but yeah, feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, so yeah, I guess we can uh, we can get started. Um, so this is lecture 20, as Professor Sasha mentioned. Uh, we're going to continue on the, on market making, and so we're going to essentially talk about the different types of market making. Um, we're going to talk about backtesting, which is definitely one key point that we would like to convey. Uh, the second key point is integration, and the third is execution. And as I said, we will take the example of digital asset markets. Um, so first, let's start with the types of market makers. So what you saw in lecture 19, I believe, was more, mostly focused on uh, profit-driven market makers. Uh, but just so you know, there are other types of market makers, and these are called designated market makers. Uh, so here we have a table that essentially summarizes the key differences between these two players in the, um, in the industry. Um, so first off, I'm going to introduce uh, the profit-driven market makers. So usually they're institutional players, uh, right? So they're prop trading firms, for example, Jane Street, you probably heard that they're doing uh, market making on ETFs and they're really, really successful. Um, for them, what I call the market efficiency, so essentially, you know, the spread and the density, we can define this if, if uh, you're not very familiar with the terms, but the spread, essentially the difference between the best bid and the best ask, um, and as well as the depth of the market, so essentially the volume that there's on each side, they don't really care about this to some extent, and I'll explain why. So that's why we mentioned that efficiency is not really considered. Um, and then, uh, however, they care about the profits a lot. So what we uh, showed here is a little formula to explain how the profits come into play. So essentially what you have here on this line uh, is essentially you're going to sum over the pairs of transactions on each side, right? So you have a sell and a buy, and you consider this as a pair, right? And so PAVA is just the price times volume, and then you deduct the trading fees. So one minus two A is the trading fee for the ask, and same for for B, uh, just a plus here because it, obviously it would become a minus when you develop this out. And so, so then we sum over the pairs of transactions and we multiply by the number of transactions. Right. So essentially the profit on one transaction multiplied by the number of transactions. Um, and so for them, you know, as the name implies, right, they're profit driven. So their objective is really to maximize the profits. And so to do so, they're going to try to maximize the number of transactions. 
and or to maximize the differences between the ask and the and the bid prices, right? And so based on this objective for them, you know, the ideal market environment is a market that is actively traded because it obviously, you know, the more it's traded, the more likely your orders will get, will get filled. And as such, we'll have more pairs of transactions as well as some spread, right? So uh, I'll show uh, right after this, I will show you how they tend to do like some order flipping within the spread. So essentially they want a large spread, but a market that is actively traded. This will be the ideal case. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the simple strategy for them really is a systematic order flipping. What does that mean? It means that let's say you're on a market, for example, you're on a stock market and you're trading Amazon stocks um, and you're going to want to enter the market first and then exit the market. But you're not going to quote, you know, both sides at the same time. What you're going to do is that you're going to flip from one side to the other. Right. Uh, so here, you know, when you anticipate sideways oscillations, really within like a certain range, you're going to try to place your orders within the spread and essentially have a buy when it's, once it's filled, have a sale and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, obviously, the distance uh, in prices is going to define, you know, your profits within each uh, pair of transaction. And then the number of times this repeats, so essentially the number of times the, the price oscillates within this range will also contribute to the profits. Uh, this is in a market where movement is sideways. Now, there is also the case where the movement is going in a certain trend, right? So you anticipate that there's a downtrend. What you want to make sure is that you optimize your order placement. So you're going to sell right above the, the best sell order, but you're going to try to buy within the order book. So a few orders below. And this is the node right here. Laurent, can you clarify a little bit how you're encoding the order book? Um, is it Absolutely. Yeah. Where are the prices or where are the sizes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here, I'll just give you like uh, the answer to this. So this is uh, these these two columns right here are prices, right? And then you have um, order quantities. Here, it's on each level, on on these uh, ex uh, like uh, farther away uh, columns. And then this is the accumulated volumes in the in the middle. And these are the number of orders on each level. Uh, we chose a market that is purposely illiquid, just to illustrate, you know, those uh, those key points. So essentially, order flipping and how you would place within the spread. So here you see that the best, let me try to zoom in. You see that the best uh, the best buy is at 313, the best sell is at 478. Uh, obviously, you know, if you place right above and right below, you'll be at 314 and 477. But this market, obviously, because the efficiency is so minimal, is not very actively traded. And we'll talk about this later, but yeah, this is- uh, the, the, the tick size is extremely small, right? It's this- Correct, yeah. So this market, uh, I'll tell you what this is. This is a certain token that uh, we're not going to name against Bitcoin. And so essentially because of the price of Bitcoin is so high, you know, the price of tokens usually are in cents or, you know, uh, fractions of cents in USD. And so they will be in what we call sats against Bitcoin. So essentially like 10 to the minus eight Bitcoin. Yeah. That's why the tick size is extremely small. Yeah. So it's easy to just front run, like if there's a bid at 3.13 to put 3.14. And... Exactly. And, and 4.77 in this case. But the problem in this market is that it's not actively traded. So you see how you have a trade-off between, and we will come back to this as well, but there's really a trade-off between efficiency and profits, right? So the less efficient, the greater uh, the potential for profit is, but the less the orders will get filled, the less often they will get filled. So there really is a trade-off. And this will come in the subtleties at the end, if uh, hopefully if we have some time to to go over that. But yeah, uh, do you guys have any questions so far for profit driven? Or I guess I'll just uh, I'll just keep going. So um, here um, we're going to talk about designated market makers. So we saw profits; they're trying to increase, you know, um, essentially like how much they make on capital. And on the other end, we have designated market makers, and these guys are hired directly by issuers. What are issuers? People who issue their own stocks. For example, a company goes public, or um, in our case, token issuers. So essentially, people who create their own asset and they go through an ICO or an STO, so initial coin offering, security token offering, this kind of stuff. It's roughly speaking is the equivalent of an IPO, so essentially going public. Um, and as I said, this is true in traditional markets, right? So stocks and so on, as well as digital assets. And this paper right here, you have access to it, by the way, on the lecture notes. Um, essentially what this paper states is that there are actually listed firms, uh, for example, on NASDAQ that are, uh, 
sort of like required to hire market makers. Uh, and so uh, we the requirements from what I've heard was like three designated market makers to be considered for listing on NASDAQ. Um, so what is a designated market maker then? A designated market maker is not going to care so much about profits, but it's going to care about efficiency of the markets. And so really their objective is to minimize uh, sigma. What is sigma? The spread in price. So essentially the difference between ask one and, and the bid one at time t to maximize the depth. So here, this is the volume of asks at time t, the sum of the ask orders. So essentially um, on this side, the, the red side here, the sum of these orders and to maximize the volume of the bids, right? At time t as well. But at the same time, you wanna be able to minimize the exposure uh, given the inventory that you're being provided with, right? So um, again, there's a trade-off. We want the narrowest spread possible. We want the best liquidity, so the best depth, but at the same time, we want to limit our exposure uh, given the budget of the client, right? And so what are the profits then? There are two players in this case. Why? Because there's a client who is hiring the designated market maker, and this client is going to provide inventory to the market maker to trade with, so essentially to quote on both sides. Um, and so there are two players, the designated market maker and the client. And so you see here that the profits are completely different. For the designated market maker, usually it's a fixed fee. So we agree on a contract, we agree to a certain flat fee, essentially, um, that the issuer is going to pay for the service. However, the profit for the client is going to be exactly the same as the profits for a profit-driven market maker minus this constant term, right? So essentially minus whatever they pay the market maker. So this is essentially what you see here, this being exactly the same formula as above, but this constant term is whatever they pay the market maker. And here we stated that price discovery dictates the profits of the client. Why? Because these markets are known to be highly volatile and they're known to be... Uh, um, sort of like uh, risky to trade on. And so uh, it's possible that when a token issuer is going to list at a certain price, this is not at all the perception of the market or the perception of the public for this asset, right? So it's possible that people are going to dump right away and the price is going to crash or conversely, if they list it too low, people are going to take advantage of it and push the price up to a greater extent. So as uh, as per the above, uh, the ideal market environment is an illiquid market. Why? Again, because we want to have the most impact possible, reduce the spread, increase the depth, uh, so increase the liquidity of the market. And we're going to show you a very simple strategy that consists in a certain order ladder, what we call an order ladder, so essentially systematically placing orders on both sides in a certain way to meet the exchange or the issuer requirement, right? So usually the requirement is going to come as a certain requirement for spread, a certain requirement for depth around the mid price. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the role of a designated market maker. And here the exposure is somewhat challenging to control because no matter what the price does, if the price crashes, you're supposed to quote, you're supposed to buy from, from uh, external people. When the price rises, you're supposed to sell to them no matter what you want to do. Ideally speaking, you wouldn't want to buy when the price is going down necessarily, right? You might want to wait until the price is reaching a bottom, although you might not know what the bottom is, but there are ways to anticipate certain you know, thresholds and so on. So here exposure is very challenging to control. Um, so these are roughly speaking, the types of market makers. Uh, do you guys have any questions at this point or should I continue to backtest? This is just a little intro to, to the industry and the types of market makers uh, that exist out there. All right. So um, the second section is on backtesting. Really, this is one of the key points that we want to convey here. Um, so backtesting, I'm sure that you've heard the term before, maybe you've done um, some yourself. Uh, essentially, it consists in taking historical data and see if the strategy that you want to implement would have worked in a theoretical environment, right? Um, so this is exactly what we're going to do here, and we're going to talk a little bit about risk hedging. Um, so first things first, we want to pull the data that we need, right? So we're going to use an API. We'll talk a little bit more about APIs later on. So uh, you may keep the questions for now on the REST APIs and such. Um, uh, but I will just go briefly over this. So essentially what we're trying to do here, we are on a test market, right? So test Bitcoin against test USD, essentially Bitcoin against USD. 
Uh, T stands for trading, doesn't matter that much. This is a convention for this exchange. Um, and we're going to try to pull this data. This data is public and we're going to use the candles function. So essentially I'll show you later when we talk about APIs, what a function looks like. Um, we're going to use this function. So connect directly to the exchange server and we're going to retrieve the historical data in the form of candles. Uh, you see here that candles can be uh, different uh, uh, time slices, I want to call them. Uh, so you have one minute, five minutes, and so on. Uh, parameters is uh, something that we'll cover later as well. So essentially how many candles you want. Uh, and then we're, we have a start and the end uh, timestamp. Um, and so for example, let's say that we use this URL to check what the return looks like. So it's going to uh, look something like, uh, let me check this. So this is the return of the uh, of the uh, API, right? So we're talking right now about the exchange Bitfinex, uh, which is one of the major digital asset exchanges. And essentially what we did is that we decided to pull 10,000 uh, candles uh, within a certain, uh, within a certain uh, time period, right? And so you have open, high, low, close, and volumes. Um, so this is pulling the data. So first things first, we want to execute this block. Uh, you can execute this at the same time as me. Um, just so you know, when we get to execution, it's best that I execute. So I show you on the UI um, how the algorithm is going to behave. Because if we all execute at the same time, the algorithms are going to conflict with one another. Um, so here we just pulled the data. This is just an example to show you what the return would be uh, with just uh, two candles, right? So we pulled 10 minutes uh, before the lecture started. Um, and uh, we got the, the, two, the two latest candles, essentially. Uh, so what we're going to do here is that we're going to show you uh, data for, for sideway movement. So essentially, when the price oscillates within a given range, start and end will be exactly the same price, right? So we want to execute this as well. And we're going to, so essentially, this is almost the same code as above. It's just going to plot what the data looks like. So first period here is denoted as sideways because the price, as I said, is, is oscillating. Uh, so we got the data here, um, and this is what the price chart looks like. So now you may wonder, how come it's not a candle chart like so, right? So we don't see candles, but rather we only see like a time series almost, right? Um, and the reason is because we only consider the close price for the purpose of the example, just for simplicity, um, but we only consider close prices. And so here, what's interesting to note, obviously on this period, this is a few days, by the way, and it's five minute candles. Uh, uh, so the, the start price and the end price are exactly the same. So I'll give you the example of the strategy that we're going to backtest, right? So this is designated market making again. So this is the systematic placement of orders on both sides of, uh, of the market. So we're assuming a simple ladder of orders, right? We've spread two BPU. BPU is base price units, so tick size, as Professor Sasha was, was uh, mentioning earlier. Right? So essentially, we want to leave exactly one price level in between our bid and our ask. The best bid we place, the best ask we place. And density, so essentially the spacing of orders within one side is one base price unit. Right. So essentially, our orders will be, say, the, uh, the price, the, the tick size is exactly one unit. So you will have, you know, your if the price, the mid price is 10, you will have your first sell at 11, second sell at 12, and so on and so forth, and same on the buy side. right? And the quantity is constant in quote. So what is quote? Uh, when you have a market, a Forex market or a digital asset or like a crypto market, let's say, you have a base asset quoted against a quote asset, right? So for example, Bitcoin against USD, your base asset is Bitcoin, your quote asset is USD, right? Uh, so here, our quantity is constant in quote. So essentially on each of the price levels for this order ladder, we're going to have exactly the same volume in, in USD. And so just so you have an idea, when people come to us, they uh, have this requirement format. They're like, okay, the spread needs to be two BPU density plus or minus 10 BPU is 13.5, right? Um, so this is what the requirement would look like on a contract. And uh, this is the strategy that we use uh, to fulfill this. So here, this is the, this is the actual backtesting code. So I'll just give you a brief description of what this does. Um, so we start with a certain balance of Bitcoin, 200 Bitcoin, 3 million USD, and a quantity that is fixed on each price level of 1.5 thousand USD. And again, this is determined according to the requirements and risk tolerance. 
Um, so what we're going to do is that we're going to check essentially from one period to the next. So if you go back to this graph, we're going to check from one period to the next if the price uh, at time t is lower than the time at time um, t minus one. We're going to try to um, we're going to consider essentially that our sell orders got filled, and vice versa. When the price is lower at time t compared to time t minus one, we're going to try uh, and consider that the buy orders were filled. So this is exactly what uh, we did here, right? So the uh, candle I, if the candle I minus the candle I minus one, so essentially the price at I minus uh, the price at I minus one is positive, we're going to adjust the balance in Bitcoin and USD accordingly. So the balance of Bitcoin is going to go down because we're essentially selling and the balance of USD is going to go up, right? Because we're effectively buying. And conversely, when the price is going down from one period to the next, Bitcoin is going up because we're buying Bitcoin, but we're using USD to buy this Bitcoin. And so that's why we adjusted the price, uh, the, the balance in USD uh, with a negative coefficient. And so what we're going to do here is we are going to plot what the balance changes would look like in a market that looks like this, right? So sideways oscillations start and end is exactly the same. We're going to see what the balance changes uh, look like. So there's no inventory control here. You're just laying laying these orders have yes. tick. Yeah, absolutely. And this will come in the subtleties. This is just to illustrate the back testing. Um, we'll talk about you know the ladder and how it should be designed in reality, facing certain constraints um, in the subtleties. Absolutely. But yeah, as you said, there's no constraints about trading fees, about inventory control, exposure, that kind of stuff. There's absolutely none of that. This is a very simple, you know, like systematic order placement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, the market going sideways, start and end, exactly the same. And this is what we see. So USD change is exactly uh, replicating what the shape, uh, by the way, this is in percent change. This is exactly replicating what the, what the price change looks like, right? Because uh, essentially uh, when the price of Bitcoin goes up, you're going to sell so you're going to gain some, some USD, I'm sorry. Uh, um, so essentially, when the, price, uh, when the price goes up, we're going to sell Bitcoin, so we're going to gain the USD. And that's why the USD uh, shape, uh, the USD price shape looks exactly like the, uh, the movement of Bitcoin against USD. And you, another interesting thing to note is that you're exactly mirroring this when we talk about the Bitcoin change, right? Because the quantity is constant in quote, you're going to have exactly the same percent change in your Bitcoin balance and in your USD balance. So now you may wonder, but what's the point of plotting this? What's the point of you know uh, showing a market where we have exactly the same start and end point? And what we want to show is that we actually make profits. And how do we make profits? By leaving this small order price level in between where we don't place any orders, we're essentially profiting from the spread in a sense. Here, you may notice two numbers, right? So we have a first number that is a Bitcoin uh, change in percent. So this is 4.9%. And a USD uh, balance change that is uh, exactly zero, right? So we're at equilibrium in terms of uh, USD, but our balance in the Bitcoin went up. And why is that? The price of USD, as we talked about, went exactly from the point uh, number one to the last point in the period, uh, these two prices were exactly the same, right? So essentially you're not gaining any exposure to USD in a sense, you're not sort of like losing exposure, I wanna call it to USD, but rather you're completely neutral. However, because of the fluctuations, you're every time, so essentially what do we call os uh, oscillations? Within a given uh, range, the price is going to go up and down. So for example, here, if we have a line, we're going to profits by the differences in pairs of transactions within this oscillation. And this is true for os uh, every oscillation, no matter how big they are, where you can consider this uh, right here as one big oscillation. And same here, it doesn't matter the, the, the side, like the order doesn't matter, up and down or down and up doesn't really matter. So here, for example, we're going to profit as well. And every time this profit is going to make us gain a little bit in terms of, uh, of Bitcoin balance. And that's why the net result for Bitcoin is a 5% increase and the net result for USD is a 0% uh, change, right? 
So this was the case when the price was going sideways, oscillating within a given range. But now let's take a look at what happens if the price is actually going in a downtrend. So I'm just going to execute. Uh, Laurent, can I ask you a question? So sure. is it fair to describe this market making strategy as put orders at every level on the ask side, at every tick, let's put one sell order, at every yeah. level on the buy side, you put one buy order. Mm -hmm. And every time you execute these orders due to your price movements, you replenish this process. You, you sort of like, how shall I say, put, put orders everywhere and keep, keep a spread. Oh, yeah, so essentially, yeah, wanna... yeah, so essentially you place uh, every order on each uh, price level. And uh, for example, if there is a one sell order get filled, we replace it with buy order on the bottom. Yeah. You keep it rolling. Right. Know. Makes sense. So yeah, yeah, what you said is exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so because of uh, there is a spread, on so every time the price go up and then go down by the same degree, uh, uh, the same amount of uh, order will be filled on both sides. And uh, for each pair, there's a difference. And this difference is exactly the spread minus the, the, the spread minus the density, which means um, the distance uh, of, uh, of the two first orders on each side minus the distance of the orders uh, on, the boat, on the same side. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. So this is, uh, we, we showed you backtesting when the market is oscillating within a given range. Now let's talk about what happens in a trend, right? This might be your question. And this is going to lead us nicely into risk hedging, right? So I'll execute this again, just to show you the graph when it goes down, for example. And you see here that the start price and the end price are actually start is higher than end, right? So obviously the market is going down. Um, and I'm going to run this again and I'll explain what happens. So here, obviously our Bitcoin balance is going up. Why? Because the price of Bitcoin is going down. So as it goes down, our buy orders get filled and we effectively buy Bitcoin. So our Bitcoin balance goes up and we're buying this Bitcoin with USD. So our USD balance is going down, obviously. What happens to the changes though? Uh, we see that there is a positive change in the balance of Bitcoin and there's a negative change in the balance of USD. However, it is not necessarily the case uh, that we are going to make losses on this. Why? Because you see that the price is not going up in a straight line. Rather, it's going up with certain oscillations. And because of this pattern, we're going to, again, profit on those oscillations, right? Um, so it is possible that actually the net result for this is a positive. Uh, I'm not saying it, it's going to be necessarily the case. There's certain things that the number of oscillations is a very critical factor, for example. So here, it's not the same if we have just a few oscillations rather than a certain number. Um, so, you know, the number of oscillations obviously matters, as we saw in the formula earlier. Um, but also, you know, the extent of price change, right? It's very possible that one asset is going to go down very much in price, and this is going to counteract sort of like the profits that you made on oscillations. Uh, but the, 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 um, the idea here is that we're not necessarily losing money effectively if you consider losses in USD, for example. So you would be converting your price of Bitcoin at the end time of the period into USD and check, you know, like the balances uh, as compared to uh, the start point in USD as well. And so why do I want to talk about risk hedging now? Because some people consider the gain of one asset as an adverse event. What does that mean? It means that some people don't like to gain Bitcoin or don't like to gain exposure to Bitcoin. Why? Very simply because it's an extremely volatile asset and they consider that it's hard to predict the price and they are not very uh, fans, so let's call it, of, um, of Bitcoin. So rather they would rather hedge their risk. And so how do you do this? You use derivatives. And so essentially as you're gaining exposure to Bitcoin, right? So your balance of Bitcoin increases over time. You're going to open short positions on Bitcoin uh, and adjust this short position according to the position of uh, Bitcoin that you're gaining exposure to, right? So essentially you're gaining balance in Bitcoin. Now, if the price of Bitcoin is going up, your short is going to be losing, right? So you're going to be at equilibrium. However, if Bitcoin is going down, now you're going to gain on the short and you'll be at equilibrium as well. Right. And so one of the mechanisms that we use to to hedge the risk, uh, Professor Sasha was mentioning 
um, uh, exposure and how do we mitigate exposure? And this is exactly how on a market where one of the assets has a derivative that is liquid enough, we're able to open short positions to counteract the gain of exposure on one asset. So this was just a summary, uh, I guess, about backtesting for designated market making. So essentially placing this ladder of orders. Um, now we're going to talk to you guys about uh, API integration. So essentially how to connect in order to conduct algo trading, you need to connect to the servers and the exchange servers or the broker servers and uh, uh, execution, right? So how do you write your execution code according to different API structures? Uh, I guess I'll introduce BitFinex real quick. Um, I think there's something that I want to add. add. Okay. So here, here. Oh, okay. So you see the during the downtrend, so just something add to the risk hedging part. Uh, the percentage in, uh, change, uh, the percentage gain on uh, Bitcoin is this per much percent. The percentage loss of uh, USDT is, uh, oh, this is USD. Okay. The percentage USD. loss of USD is this much percent. Uh, the percentage gain and is a little bit higher than the percentage uh, loss. However, during this process, the percentage gain is Bitcoin. Uh, during this process, the total value of Bitcoin decreased. So, so this much uh, will this will sometimes will result this uh, percentage gain is actually less valuable than this uh, percentage right. loss in USD. Yeah. So, in order to counter this, is you always maintain a, a negative position in the, uh, the in the derivative market to counter the the price fluctuation in Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, essentially. And also, however, there is the problem is that uh, the the, uh, the derivative price is not always equal to the real asset price. Um, so it's not. So this uh, method is not completely hedging, but uh, on average, it should also the derivative price should also follow the real asset price. Mm -hmm. So it hedges the risk to some extent. Right. <laughs> And, and the, the the derivatives are they traded on the CME or what what is the where are you executing these derivatives? Uh, so there is something called perpetual contract on uh, on for crypto market. Basically, um, it's a contract where it offers you opportunity to short bitcoins. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not listed on any uh, traditional exchanges it's right. also listed on a crypto exchange however it's uh, the crypto exchange themselves de designed this uh, derivative mm -hmm. and they uh, they have some internal mechanic to make the price uh, follow the real uh, asset price mm -hmm. so essentially like uh, in traditional markets usually you will have a future with a certain expiration date uh, in uh, crypto, not necessarily, it's called perpetual contracts, so they never expire, quote unquote, uh, but it allows you to open short and long positions. And so you see here, for example, we have the top uh, spot exchanges. This is a, a sort of like a data reporting uh, website for crypto. It's called CoinMarketCap. And on it, you will see certain exchanges are spot exchanges, right? So they only have like regular trading, maybe they offer margin here and there. Um, and the one that we're uh, taking as an example is Bitfinex right here. Um, and then you have derivative exchanges. So some of them overlap, right? So for example, Binance, Huobi, they're also spot. Uh, OKEx is also spot and so on, right? Um, so sometimes you will find the derivatives on the exact same exchange, uh, crypto exchange or digital asset exchange. Uh, sometimes you will have to go to a different exchange to, to be able to do so, yeah. Um, so yeah, let's go to API integration. Yeah. So the um, the uh, example that we're taking here is Bitfinex, as I said. Uh, so this is what the uh, user interface uh, looks like. We're using a paper trading account, so it's not obviously real money, and it's not. Uh, so this chart, you might wonder why it looks a little weird. See that there's some action here, no action here. Uh, the exchange has an, uh, a match like a matching engine, so essentially they would replicate exactly the live trading onto paper trading, um, but uh, they stopped at some point. It's not very important for us, uh, but just so you know, this is what the user interface looks like. This is the name of the exchange. You have your price chart right here. You have your orders here. We have no order yet. 
the balance says this is how you would place order manually, right? So you have a couple orders, limit, market, whatever that means. Uh, I mean, you guys know what these two are at least. And then you have a few others that are essentially automating, you know, certain order placement and so on and position close and stuff. And here, very importantly, this is what uh, interests us. We have a full order book, right? So for example, if I click here, I'll be able to see like the entire order book. Um, and this is not going to mean a whole lot, but we see essentially all the orders on the market, at least for Bitfinex, right? Um, so here is our buy side, here is our sell side. Again, you have prices. You have um, quantities uh, either accumulated or per order uh, and number of orders uh, per price level. And so here, so this is in, uh, in dollars. So you see the price of Bitcoin is 17K, 17.7K. Uh, tick size is uh, one, uh, $1 essentially. Um, so again, taking Bitfinex paper trading as an example, we have a link to the doc. So the API doc is the reference that is going to allow you to connect to the exchange uh, servers directly. It looks something like this. So we'll talk about all of this in a second. Um, but essentially, you have a few functions, and you can use those functions directly uh, and uh, essentially build a connector uh, using whatever language you want, actually, or runtime. Um, but uh, you will be able to sort of like plug your execution code directly onto the connector. And so uh, I'm going to go quickly over REST API. Tom is going to cover WebSocket API. Um, so first of all, what is a REST API? It's a, a request response structure. So it means that you have to send a request, and the, answer, the, the, the server is going to answer you. And you will see the nuance with uh, WebSocket in a minute. Um, you don't have to maintain a stable connection. It means that your connection can literally drop in the middle, and it doesn't matter that much. Uh, you're actually going to still be able to keep going. Uh, the execution speed is limited by request limits. This means that certain exchanges don't want you to exceed a certain number of uh, uh, requests per minute because it's going to, or per second, it's going to overload their servers and they don't want you know, one user to take over, you know, like whatever, like the activity of the entire thing. And then you have a server client latency, meaning that when you send your request, you have some latency between you, your local computer, your cloud uh, computing, um, system and the exchange and vice versa, right? So it's sort of like a ping pong, right? You have latency on the way to the server and back from the server, right? So you have sort of like double latency. And the reason why we talk about REST API is because it's sort of like the standard in digital assets. Uh, most exchanges, if not all, have a REST API, uh, but not all of them have a WebSocket API. Uh, so I'm going to quickly go over REST API uh, not everything is in is in the the Jupyter notebook, but hopefully you can uh, get the the structure. Uh, there are four components. First component is what we call URL or endpoint, or it has a bunch of different names. Second component is uh, essentially the method. Third component is the headers, and fourth component is the body. So I will define all of them. First one is URL. This is what we see here, right? A classic URL. Uh, on this URL, you may have what we call path parameters, right? So they're denoted, so the URL usually has slash with like a certain keyword, um, and they're denoted by slash and then a column, right? So these are your path parameters. They're part of the URL, but they're sort of like variables. Um, and then you have what we call uh, query parameters, still part of the URL, but they come after a question mark and they follow one another with an ampersand. Um, so for example, if I take this here, uh, this is a path parameter. The one M denoting one minute is a path parameter. And this is a query string. And all is called the endpoint or the URL or the CURL, depending on the convention that you have. So this is the first part. And to be precise, the exact endpoint or the exact sort of like function that I'm using is candle. And it's defined here. Uh, so essentially, this is the base URL, and then you have uh, you have your specific endpoint uh, to call. The second part of the REST API is uh, method. Uh, so the second part is method. So you have essentially a few methods. You have get, post, put, uh, patch, and delete. Put and patch are roughly similar. They consist in updating data. Get is really reading data. So for example, you want to get historical data, you're going to uh, do a get request. And then post are uh, uh, writing data. And delete is essentially uh, removing data uh, from the server. 
So in general, public endpoints, we'll talk about this in a second as well, public endpoints only have get, and at least for trading, and then uh, authenticated endpoints or private endpoints uh, usually have post, delete, and so on. So what are we doing here? Uh, we are essentially building a connector to a couple of different functions. First function is an order book. Second function is the headers. Uh, and let's talk about headers now. So essentially headers is something usually in a JSON format that allows you to sign your request. So uh, certain endpoints pertain to your account, your trading account. And because of this, you need to obviously authenticate yourself as if you were logging into the user interface, but rather you do it with headers. Uh, it's, it's essentially like a JSON format and it's like a key parameter type of uh, thing, almost like a dictionary, but with double quotes. Um, and the last part, usually this is true for post. It's not true for get, but for all the other uh, methods, you have uh, body parameters. So essentially, uh, for example, if you want to place an order, you're going to specify your limit price, you're going to specify the quantity and so on and so forth. And so here we define a, pu a public connector to the, uh, to the fu function order book. So essentially to retrieve the order book data. Here we're signing uh, the request. Here we're uh, calling uh, the place order. And here we're calling the get order function. Uh, so this is for the, for the REST API. Tom, do you want to cover WebSocket? Yeah, so WebSocket. WebSocket is a, uh, is a two-way connection between the client and the server, which means uh, uh, you have to maintain this long-lived connection, and, uh, and there you can send data to the client and to the server, and the server can send data directly to client without client requesting anything. So usually, uh, WebSocket is uh, more feasible for high-frequency trading. Because uh, first of all, the piece of data, the, the, the data transmitting efficiency is much higher than uh, REST API. For example, you're querying the order book data. For REST API, uh, usually what you're going to do is to run a loop. You request the data every, for example, 200 milliseconds uh, based on the request limit. And every time the server will give you the full order book data, every time you request, However, the change uh, the changes of the order book doesn't necessarily happen every 200 uh, milliseconds. Sometimes maybe 600 milliseconds, there's no change, but you don't know there's no change. So you ha still have to cure it. So uh, you still have to make a lot of requests. And sometimes uh, the, the moment, right the moment after you send one request, there is a change. However, uh, in your program, you Cure, the next query will be 200 milliseconds later, so there will be a added latency. However, WebSocket, once you establish this connection, um, the server will send you data whenever there is an update. Uh, you don't have to set the period to uh, request data over and over. And every time, the server will only send the change of the data you're requesting. To you so the pieces of information are smaller so it's more scalable however the down uh, the downside of websocket is that you have to maintain this uh, long-lived connection so your server structure has to be static you have to either have a static computer that maintain this connection or um, or a virtual machine that maintain this connection but rest api you can maintain uh, this uh, in a decentralized manner you can have a pool of virtual machines, and um, each iteration is a different machine that is requesting the data from the server. So this is WebSocket. Usually, WebSocket has channels. Uh, for example, when you watch YouTube, every different YouTube is a channel. Once you click this uh, YouTube video, you're subscribed to this channel. So every time there's a stream, the, the data stream will come from server once you subscribe. It's the same for trading. Uh, for example, you subscribe the channel called order book Bitcoin slash USD. And then every time the order book of Bitcoin USD has a change, the server will send you a, an update that represents this change. So. So for this, uh, the the execution code structure will be very different. Uh, here is what we do. Uh, this is the rest. Uh, yeah. So 
if you look at the documentation, it's here. Yeah, uh, and go down. So okay, this is uh, lower. Yeah. So usually, um, where's the first page of the documentation? Yeah. Yeah, so in the overview of the documentation, um, when you check out a uh, documentation of WebSocket, they will give you a URL, which is the um, which is the DNS uh, server DNS you need to talk to, and this is how you establish a connection. And then they will tell you uh, all the channels. They will tell you how to uh, subscribe to a channel. Usually. Uh, when you want to subscribe to a channel, you need to send a message to a server in a, a certain format. Uh, for example, here, you send a JSON format with the event uh, is subscribed and the channel is channel name. Uh, channel name could be something like uh, ticker data, order book, last traded price, and some other parameters. So when you send this, you're subscribed to this channel Upon the subscription, the server will give you a snapshot of, uh, for example, you're subscribed to your order book data. The server will send you a snapshot of order book, and you maintain this connection ma and maintain this subscription. Every time the order book changes, it will send you update. So uh, if you're using Python, a very uh, Straightforward library is uh, WebSocket uh, and WebSocket slash client. So here you um, create a connection with the with this URL according to the according to the documentation. You also need to uh, define a function to for you to subscribe to channels, which is defined here. So here's how you send the uh, information to to the server. And uh, also, you also need a listener. Uh, the listener uh, pretty much uh, listens to the message that the server sent to you, which is here. Uh, basically, it will be an event loop. Uh, every time uh, you receive a message, it will be here. So handler, what is this? So for your listener method, you have to uh, be able to attach a callback function. This handler is your callback function. Callback function is invoked once you receive a message. What, uh, once you receive a message and you do something about this message according to this callback function. So for a lot of uh, for a lot of uh, exchanges APIs, they have a different URL for public uh, information and authenticated information. Public information um, is just, uh, uh, the, for example, historical data, live data. Authentic information is the information that is related to your account specifically. So you need to use your API keys to do the authentication. So since there are two URLs, so you need to maintain two connections. So here you will need to do some parallel programming here. In this example, we're, we will be using threading. Um, threading, uh, the code structure will be uh, very similar to multiprocess. However, threading, um, you maintain two thread within the same pr uh, process. Uh, if you are familiar with uh, async IO, there's another library other than this example called WebSockets. The difference is uh, it's a plural. So the difference is that every uh, method of uh, this WebSockets is a coroutine. So it's compatible with uh, the async await structure of uh, if you're using uh, Python version higher than 3.5. So here you maintain two thread and you attach a callback function here. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think we're running a little bad. Uh, is there any questions? All right. So we're a little behind schedule. So let's uh, let's summarize what we did. We did back testing for designated market making. 
Now we talked about integration, how to connect to Exchange uh, APIs. Um, and now what we're going to show is quickly some execution code with a very basic uh, profit-driven market making this time. Um, and essentially, we're going to show examples both in terms of uh, REST API and in terms of WebSocket. So first of all, the structure of the strategy is the following. Uh, Profit-driven, so essentially the order flipping mechanism. So we're going to place a first order, we're going to enter the market, we're going to place a bid above the best bid. Whenever this order is filled, we're going to place an order, a sell order, one tick size above this bid. So for example, you place this bid at 10 and the tick size is one, you wanna place the sell at 11, right? And then whenever both of these orders are filled, so essentially the pair of orders is filled, you're going to repeat the, the, the loop. So here, what we're going to use is a while loop simply because essentially every time we make a request, very easy to, to do, not uh, the same structure as WebSocket. WebSocket, you have to maintain those connections, those channels as, as uh, Tom mentioned. So what are we doing? We're essentially building the client object. So essentially we're uh, putting in the keys uh, these are some global constants. What are they? For example, the symbol, for example, you know, the, the difference between the two orders that you want to place and so on and so forth. Sleep is just between iterations, how long, how many seconds you want to, to have and so on. Okay, so the three steps we described right here are uh, clearly defined here. First, we request the order book data, check if the condition is met, and then place the buy order. So essentially the condition is the sum of the buy has to be two times the sum of the uh, sell on the first three price levels. And why did we do it this way? Because if you uh, read Professor Sasha um, uh, article on order book dynamics, you will see that it's possible to interpret uh, certain arrivals of orders and cancellation of orders uh, in a short term price movement sort of, right? So you interpret the order book dynamics to anticipate very short term uh, uh, price of, uh, movements. Um, so here we assume that, you know, if the first three buys are two times the size of the first three sells, very simply speaking, we assume that the price will go slightly up. So we want to place this bid, get it filled, place the sell and profit. Uh, so then the second step is to check if the bid order is filled, we're going to place the sell order. And then the final step is if both are filled, then we repeat, essentially. Uh, you can go through the code once you have a, a little bit of time. We're running a little uh, behind schedule, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. I just want to show, if possible, let me see. I'll try to run both on the Jupyter Notebook. So this is the REST client, and this is the execution code in REST. And so essentially, you're going to see some uh, printing here. Uh, so essentially, we're printing the date we're printing the size of the uh, ask side, uh, the first three levels, and the side of the uh, the size of the bid uh, side. So essentially, here you would be able to see if we had orders to be placed, you would be able to see those orders popping in. Um, but as you can see, the first three uh, bids are never really two times the first three asks. So what we can do, I can stop this and try to show you with a very simple example. We're going to put 1.01. .01 rather than uh, rather than uh, let me check rather than two times let's do it do it quickly uh, here I'm just going, going to modify the condition so the condition is right here right the sum of the bids is greater or equal to the sum of the asked times instead of two I'm going to put 1.01 just for the sake of the example just to show you how it looks like all right so here um, I still see the printing hopefully we can get the condition fairly soon otherwise we'll not wait for it I just want to show you the order showing up here, uh, getting filled, hopefully, and then the order on the other side. Let's see. Uh, do you want to try and place it by order manually? Uh, the maximum you can. How much asset we have here? Uh, it's right here. We have six Bitcoin, 100K. Price. Uh, just put uh, this price. All right, so if, if the condition doesn't happen, you will be able to test. Uh, I can give you the credentials to the account. Thing is that we shouldn't run uh, all at the same time, otherwise it will place a bunch of orders whenever the condition is met um, by order. 814, 814.
Uh, yeah, to, okay. Okay. I guess we'll not uh, we'll not see, but uh, hopefully we can uh, record a video afterwards and show you how how it would have worked. So essentially, you will see that it keeps on printing. Essentially, uh, whenever there would be an order, it would start printing. You know, like the price level at which the order is placed, the the type of order, and so on and so forth. And Tom, if you want to explain the structure very quickly about WebSocket? Yeah. Here. Yeah. So basically, um. Since we are kind of running out of time, unfortunately, the condition never met here. Right, for, for rest. For, yeah. yeah. So uh, is, this is the example of execution code with WebSocket, the exactly same uh, strategy. So what you're going to do uh, is different. Uh, so what you're going to do with WebSocket, you're actually building event listeners. You're building all kinds of callback functions. These functions are attached to the handler of the of the WebSocket client. So what it does is that you're not design, uh, defining what you're going to do in a chronicle order. You're defining what are you going to do based on what message you receive from the server. For example, uh, for the order book data, every time there is an order book data, uh, the, the order book changes. You do something accordingly. So to maintain a data. So in maintain a data on WebSocket, since not every time the exchange are sending you uh, the full data, so you're probably going to maintain a synchronized order book data locally, either using memory or using storage uh, of your choice. So in this example, we are going to use the memory to in memory to maintain the synchronized order book data. So once this order book data is maintained, Every time you need to check the conditions based on the data, you can just curate the data locally. You don't need to send uh, another request to a server. That's why WebSocket is this fast. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, callback function for the order book, which means every time there is a message from the server, you receive a message from the server that is uh, about the order book, you do this. And what it does is basically maintaining the order book data in memory. So on fill is that every time you receive a message that tells you that your order is getting filled, you do this. So what, what does it do? Every time a buy order is filled, you replace um, the filled amount as the ask order at the price that is a little bit higher than the, the price you got filled. And then you attach, uh, you build the full uh, callback function. So you basically link all these the three callbacks together. This is uh, the callback function to handle the subscription uh, confirmation from the server, and this is to handle uh, the order book uh, message, and this is to handle uh, when the server tells you that oh your order is getting filled. And then you attach this callback function to the listener, to the WebSocket listener, and you run this. Right. So yeah, so because we don't have enough time, so we're not going to go through the code in very much detail, but you can look it up in your uh, free time. Mm -hmm. So it's doing exactly the same thing. We're going to run it. Hopefully, the condition uh, are going to met. Uh, within a short time period, so you can see some orders in the interface. So here I'm just executing the WebSocket client, and then I'll be executing. Oh, actually, let me check. Uh, is this running? No. Let's just do it on Sublime, I guess. Uh, this is just. Uh, um, we're not running it directly on on the Jupyter notebook. Uh, let's see if we get the conditions. Yeah. All right. So you see here that we have an order standing, and essentially this order is a uh, limit by, and we would want this order to be filled so that we could place a sell order one above this uh, this order right here. Um, so this is usually much more reactive than uh, the REST client, um, but it's just a matter of are the conditions met. For example, we're going to spend some time getting this yeah. order filled because we have 13 Bitcoin, so it's going to take a while. But at least we showed you how you know the order got placed. And uh, you can imagine the order flipping. So essentially what you would see is one order here, then one order. Okay, so it just got 
It just got filled partially, so you see that there are a few orders that are being placed. Now it's filled completely. Yeah. So, so every time there's a fill, you play, place the ask order at a little bit higher uh, with the exactly filled amount, mm -hmm. and uh, this is what happened. I think this is still executing. I'm trying to... Is it? Sure. No, this is not executing. All right, uh, because there's more than one actually on the on the south side. Okay, so just to summarize what we saw, we saw back testing. So designated market making this order ladder that we talked about. How does it look when you oscillate? How does it look when you have a trend? Uh, and what the balance changes look like most importantly. Second, we talked about how to connect to APIs and you can review the code for REST and for WebSocket. And then we talked about execution code a little bit. Again, you can come back to the code later on. Uh, how is the execution code laid out for REST, essentially this ping pong, and then for a WebSocket, essentially subscribing, maintaining the channel and receiving updates as new events happen. Okay, so now that we saw all of this, we have an exercise suggestion. If you're interested in, in algo trading, if you're interested in implementing your own strategies, and if you're interested in having a strategy that actually works, because it turns out that this strategy is very simple and doesn't take into consideration a lot of things. But what we suggest is that you go through those uh, as a little exercise and you try to add functions to adjust the orders. Number one, you try to add indicators, right? Either using price data, or using order book dynamics to detect short-term uh, price movements. Um, and then you can also optimize the order placement conditions, right? So obviously here we didn't have trading fees, we didn't have a lot of constraints because it's all paper trading, it's all virtual, but in reality you have much more constraints. And this is actually what we're going to talk next, uh, to discuss next, sorry. Um, hopefully we can get some time uh, for questions. So I'm going to go through it very quickly. Uh, but if you have questions, please uh, feel free to ask now or at any point uh, from now on, really. Um, first things that we want to discuss is the types of market makers. We described you uh, market making as sort of like black and white. One is profits, the other one is efficiency. In reality, it's m a little, you could have blends of, uh, of those two flavors, right? So you could have profit sharing in designated market making. So instead of paying a fixed fee, the issuer that is going to hire you, is going to pay you in terms of profits as if you were a profit-driven market maker. Then you can have a hybrid designated market maker who is providing the capital and or the custody of the accounts. And then you can uh, also, the, the type of market making depends on which uh, jurisdiction that you're located in, right? So for example, a certain jurisdiction is going to uh, require you to have licenses, uh, but another is not going to, uh, to do so. And some are going to prefer to be service providers, so essentially provide the technology rather than you know providing like the sort of like the execution services in the sense that we don't want to process orders, we want to place orders you know for the client instead, and so on and so forth. So th this is just some nuances on the types of market makers. Uh, for backtesting, I just want to draw your attention to a few points. First of all, we mentioned candle chart, but in fact, we had this time series. In reality, what you want to take into consideration is really candles. So open, high, low, close, right? So you want to take all this data into consideration. And also we took into consideration five minute candles, but in reality, you have much more precise. You could have one minute uh, candles. Also, the second point is that we ignored fluctuations. What does it mean? I told you from one period to the next, we're looking at you know the close price for each period. And in fact, what we should be looking at really is how the price moved within the candle, right? So essentially, uh, did you have like some fluctuations within this candle rather than just looking at one fixed point for every candle? This would make your backtesting result much more accurate. Uh, third, the order size may matter. What does it mean? It means that essentially when you place orders here, we said, oh, we're just placing 1.5K uh, worth of USD on each price level. In reality, your order size actually matters because if you were to place those orders, the price uh, data wouldn't be the same anymore. So essentially, if, it's like if you roll back in time, you're going to influence with your orders what happens in the, in the, the future. Uh, but what you call historical data wouldn't be the same historical data, but it will be altered historical data. So in fact, your backtesting result is to take with a grain of salt, really. Um, Another point is that we ignore trading fees. So you saw in the very first formula when we talked about profit-driven and designated market making, we took into consideration this to A, to B, uh, the Greek uh, letter. Um, but we didn't take this into consideration in the execution code, in the backtest, and so on. You have to do so, otherwise you're going to have some, <laughs> some uh, bad surprise when, when you look at your balances after you implement the strategy. As Professor Stasha mentioned, 
you can actually improve the order ladder, right? So instead of having this systematic order placement, maybe you want to place some random uh, um, sizes on each price level. Uh, and so the market is going to look more natural and uh, you have some benefits. Also, you want to make sure that the density is a certain percentage of, of the spread and vice versa, just so you can make sure to profit from the spread and not actually lose money to trading fees or lose money to how the density and the spread are uh, in comparison to one another. Um, we talked a tiny, a uh, little bit about uh, risk, but risk can come in several flavors as well, right? You have risk when we have crypto to crypto pair. We talked about crypto against fiat, right? So Bitcoin against USD, Bitcoin being a crypto, USD being a fiat, but you also have the crypto against crypto risk, right? So for example, let's say that your base is a crypto and your quote is a crypto. Uh, so for example, token whatever against Bitcoin, Bitcoin, you can short, as we mentioned, but maybe token whatever you cannot short because simply the derivative doesn't exist or the derivative market is not liquid enough for you to open enough short positions, right? And then there are other risk hedging approaches. So, you know, there are strategies you can look into it if you're interested, called order book replication. So essentially, you're going to go on an exchange that has a lot of liquidity. You're going to replicate the order book like a, like a sort of like a a certain fraction of the order book onto the uh, other exchange where there's less liquidity. Uh, and you can do so not only between exchanges, but also between a liquidity pool or like an ATS, an alternative trading system, or whatever you call it, and an exchange, right? So these are interesting uh, risk hedging approaches as well. Um, yeah, uh, there's another thing about uh, that is not listed on, on this list, but uh, it's worth mentioning. When you do a back test, when you uh, think about a strategy and you run back tests. Sometimes you will make some mistake. Is you accidentally uh, so for for example uh, in your strategy the condition to open orders. Sometimes uh, you accidentally use the data from the future to uh, to calculate the open order condition. But in reality, uh, you're not supposed to have this data data in the future. So. Uh, during your iteration, due to some coding error, you might uh, make uh, accidentally make this uh, mistakes that will result in a very positive uh, <laughs> backtest result, but it's actually a bias. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk quickly about this? So before you run backtest, you have to double check your code in to make sure that all the condition doesn't include any future data. Right. Um, and API integration. So these two clients in the example are, extreme, uh, are extremely simplified. We only uh, wrapped uh, the, the methods that are relative to the execution code. But in reality, you will need a lot more uh, functionality. So it will be much more complicated. You need to, uh, whatever broker you use, whatever exchange you use, you need to go through their documentation and uh, make uh, uh, make a complete client. And uh, different API might have different standard. Uh, for example, authentication, some uh, exchange or some broker do authentication through headers. Some will uh, do authentication through the body so you need to adjust it accordingly to the api uh, according to the api documentation and the, uh, in crypto current um, market there is a, a certain type of exchange called decentralized exchange so what they're doing is that you have a crypto wallet you trade directly through your wallet through, uh, so in this case a lot of decentralized exchange they don't have api so they it's not REST and not WebSocket. So for example, every time you place an order, it's not through any API. Uh, it's through a smart contract on the blockchain. So in that case, your integration will be on the blockchain directly. So if you're interested in doing some algorithmic trading in decentralized exchange, you have to look into how to inter communicate with blockchain, uh, a very uh, popular library that communicates uh, with the uh, uh, Ethereum blockchain, for example, it's called Web3, it's uh, in JavaScript. However, there's a Python uh, library that uh, replicates the JavaScript library. It's also called Web3, you can look into it. And usually to communicate to blockchain, you also have to have a blockchain node. 
you can use a local node that sync uh, the information in the blockchain, or you can find um, you can use a node uh, node provider. The most popular node provider is called Infura. If you look it up, you will find information about it. And then the execution, um, yeah. So the strategy we gave you as an example is an extremely simplified strategy. There are a lot of things you need to take into consideration. For example, error handlers, uh, because it's a uh, internet connection between client and server sometimes will not be stable enough. So you need to handle these scenarios when there is a connection loss, when uh, the exchange server is uh, on maintenance, or sometimes your requests are blocked by firewall and you receive something weird. So these you have to all take into account, do uh, different error handlers to handle different uh, consideration. And threat safety is very important. Threat safety. So for example, in this uh, WebSocket uh, example, it's uh, there are two threads. So they're running concurrently. Sometimes uh, two different threads are doing some operation on, on the same memory space or the storage space on your computer. They might create some confliction that will, rem uh, that will create some chaos. So you need to take this into account to try to not operate on the same piece of uh, memory or same piece of storage with uh, with two different thread that are running concurrently one thread only operate one uh, one piece of memory so if you cannot do that you can create uh, another thread which is a queue so basically uh, two concurrently thread maybe have to do some operation on one piece of memory uh, instead of operate directly you send this operation to the queue and then the queue thread will will handle all the operation one by another so they will not operate on the same piece of memory uh, at the same time to avoid confliction this is a very simple example of about threat safety and then monitor and diagnose uh, you uh, you need to print messages that like you're not going to be done just by starting your strategy your algorithm you have to also babysit the algorithm you have to make sure that everything is running smoothly so the monitor we have to build monitor to see uh, the to monitor the performance of your strategy and uh, so that you know when you have to do some uh, manual inter uh, intervention and then diagnose. Diagnose is not that is to you have to run a system that to check if your algorithm is running according to the design. It's not checking if the algorithm is making profit or loss. Sometimes it's not doing the thing that it's supposed to do, but it's making the profit. But it's still something that you need to diagnose. You need to correct it because you need to make sure it's executing exactly what you're supposed to execute. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's doing the wrong thing, but it's making profit. It needs to be corrected. Sometimes it's making loss. However, it's doing the right thing. So you need to keep it running. Uh, that's the most float number calculation. So for every asset, um, the price uh, precision and volume precision uh, will be different. So you need to, if your price is calculating, uh, calculated from float number, you need to round it up to the precision accordingly. And float number calculation is something uh, you need to uh, take into consideration. For example, you do a float number plus a float number, for example, uh, 0 0.25 plus 0 0.3 in a computer, it not necessarily give you uh, 0 0.55. Sometimes uh, because the, the machine code, uh, how the machine inter uh, do the calculation, sometimes there will be a small residual. So this you also need to take into account. And you can use some kind of a rounding system or ignore the residual of uh, 
a value that is smaller uh, than a certain value to avoid uh, the float number calculation problem. Mm -hmm. So essentially everything uh, before this uh, last part in the lecture was to give you the basics of each of backtesting, integration, and execution. And here we're discussing some of the nuances both in, in each of these components, essentially. Yeah, something else you also need to take into consideration is some small details, but it's also very important. Mm -hmm. All right, so this this wraps up really like uh, the the lecture slides at least. So very happy to extend a little bit to take questions if uh, if you guys have questions. All right. Well, <clears throat> looks like the students are a little bit shy today. Let me ask uh, one or two questions that I had. Um, so I saw that you integrated with Bitfinex. Is that something you recommend to start with or Right, so um, Bitfinex, the reason why we did it on this exchange specifically is because they offer paper trading. Um, you have to be careful. Usually, so we were talking about regulations. Usually they don't like uh, US customers to, uh, to trade on their platform. However, for paper trading, because it's all virtual, it shouldn't cause any issue. Um, so that's why we would recommend this just to implement some very simple strategies. You can create an account, go on Bitfinex, and if you want, we can... Uh, we can uh, include a little tutorial on how to create a paper trading account. There's a small manipulation to do, but it's nothing very intricate. So that's why we would recommend Bitfinex. But if you're a US resident and you want to actually trade with real assets, uh, we would recommend uh, exchanges that actually allow US customers. For example, Kraken, very, Kraken is a very fa famous one. There's yeah. a lot of liquidity on it. So you can go for it. They allow uh, US customers, yeah. And in terms of this, and I imagine this REST versus WebSocket choice is something that will happen no matter what exchange you deal with. Do you, is it something where you f your first implementation is a REST API and then when you're really confident with it, you do a translation of the code or? No, it's more like some exchange only has REST API. Some exchanges only have WebSocket API. Right. So for example, some, uh, some exchange, they have both. So you can choose. But uh, a lot of cases, you don't have tr uh, any choice. For example, IB only has uh, WebSocket API. So yeah, there's, there's like a, how their uh, server infrastructure is laid out, right? Is it REST? Is it WebSocket? Is it a mix of both? And then the strategy takes in, uh, you know, comes into play, right? Do you want to execute your strategy as like a high frequency trading strategy, for example, in which case you would be better off with a WebSocket implementation. And so you have to find the corresponding exchanges or the corresponding brokers that allow for WebSocket. And if your strategy is more of like a, quote unquote, medium term slash long term strategy, but you want to automate it still, then rest socket should be fine. And then you can use, you know, the, the corresponding exchanges or bro uh, brokers. Yeah. So I, I guess uh, I'll, ha I'll have one last question. Um, what about, is there a, a, a trend of co-location to these exchanges? Like, do, do people want to be very, very close to the exchanges or that trend hasn't happened yet? Yeah, that's... Uh, yes, uh, but very, in crypto, very few exchanges offers uh, co-location service. Right. Uh, basically, co-location still uh, minimize the latency, which is uh, if your strategy is very time sensitive, yeah. is then uh, we would and uh, the exchange or broker you trade on offers the co-location service. Definitely, you can use it. Right. Uh, just so you know, co-location implies other fees, obviously, usually. Uh, sometimes they will tell you if they're not extremely sophisticated in other terms, they don't have their own server infrastructure, but they're on AWS, for example, or any cloud computing uh, uh, service provider. Uh, they're going to tell you, okay, we're on AWS, for example, EU North, right? Europe North. And you will be able to sort of like place, you know, your uh, code or host your code um, on the same region for AWS, for example. Or, um, but some exchanges, for example, I believe BTSC is an exchange that we heard about, uh, they offer co-location services within their own servers. So essentially you are not necessarily on the same region, but you're exactly at the same geographical point. So this is a trend that is coming, yeah. yes, but is it, it's not very developed just yet.
Okay, so um, if the students, if no one has any questions, uh, thanks a lot for this uh, great inter introduction to cryptocurrencies. Um, um, so again, th thanks for doing this. Um, I'm excited to uh, to get a glimpse of what you guys are doing, and uh, and I think that uh, the finance world and the cryptocurrency world are sort of going to be very close in the future. So so um, so, anyways, thanks again for for presenting this. Thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. And yeah, and many of these concepts, uh, you know, like market making, inventory control, and and all of that, they sort of apply in in uh across asset so it's it's nice right. to see, it's nice to see the similarities yeah absolutely yeah. okay well i'll i'll stop the recording now